Hello everyone, it's good to have you joining us again on another episode of the program Clinicology coming to you from New Frontiers Television and my name is Temi Tokwe Oladi Kohan, I'll be your host on the program and perhaps it is your first time of tuning in this is a health program where we'll discuss health related issues believing in the fact that health is wealth today we'll be discussing one another health challenge which has called for attention of the entire world recently the world celebrated world pneumonia and they would a team champion the cause to fight against pneumonia so this is what we'll be talking about on today's episode of the program what exactly is pneumonia what are the symptoms the signs to look out for when we want to know if it's pneumonia if it's malaria or something related these are many more will form the basis of our discussion on clinicology today so sit down relax and be educated on what and what pneumonia is or what and what pneumonia is not my guest on the show today is a general practitioner and he is dr adeleye Barbarisa. It's good to have you joining us on the program, sir. It's a privilege. Thank you so much. Like I said, that pneumonia has called for a public observant and for a day to be set aside to look at people who have died due to this ailment, to look at the challenges confronting tackling this ailment, even to its minimal, uh, to the BRS minimum. So we want to look at how do we champion the cause against ending pneumonia in our society, in the country, and at world at large. But it's good to start from the foundation to know what exactly is pneumonia is from the medical perspective. Yes, pneumonia simply is uh, when there is infection of the lungs or in the local palace, the chest, uh, because um, breathing is very, very important for living. We all have to breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide. And it's our lungs that, that is responsible for that. Okay, so uh, whenever infection gets into our lungs, which is not normal, mm -hmm. it now makes the place that's supposed to be occupied with hair become occupied with infection and fluid, then it now becomes difficult to breathe. So whenever there's infection of the lungs, um, that individual has what we call pneumonia. Okay, even before it gets to like infection of the lung, yes. like you rightly said, are there some stages before it gets to something that we can say that, oh, this is pneumonia? Yes. Does it have stages? Yes. It's important we understand that um, there is a respiratory tract. What I mean by respiratory tract is that there is a pipe that connects your nurseries or your mouth to your lungs. Okay? So um, the pipe continues as the trachea. You know, from the mouth, of course, you have the pharynx. After the pharynx, you have the larynx. After the larynx, you have the trachea. Those ones are just straight pipes that come down from your nose down okay. then by the time it gets to the center of your chest the pipe divides into two each of them supplies the two lungs okay the two pipes that divide into are called the bronchus or the bronchi okay then it enters eventually into the alveoli which is the lungs okay, okay so that means that the infection can occur at every of those stages okay for example we could have what we call a pharyngitis uh, where the part of the throat the pipe in the throat gets mm -hmm. infected and you know that causes sore throat for some of us. Okay. We could have what we call um, trachitis, where the pipe that leads it downwards get infected. We could have a bronchitis, the pipe that directs it into the two lungs get infected. So um, at times the infection could actually be descending. Okay, starting from what we all call common cold, you know, okay. people sneezing, Running you know, and all those. that. Mm -hmm. But those things are different from pneumonia. One could have all those things. One could have a sore throat, one could have a laryngitis that affects the voice, you know, loss of voice and all that without, not having, without necessarily having pneumonia. Okay. And it's important one understands um, the difference. And the stages as well. Yes. Okay. okay. You know, uh, there is this saying that not, not, nothing just happened yeah. that will be a cause for it. But before yeah. we talk about the cause, you know, you said something about it. Sometimes they may think, people may think that it's malaria, whereas it is not. Yes. 
maybe though, maybe because it doesn't have some visible symptoms. Now, if I may ask, what do you, what are the symptoms or the signs that are visible for one to point out that this is pneumonia? You see, the interesting thing about pneumonia is that it's one of the diseases that it's either underdiagnosed or overdiagnosed. In other words, it's either undermanaged or overmanaged. For example, someone calls me and says, um, Doctor, my child has, is coughing and has catar. Okay. You know, that, um, which antibiotic should I buy for the child? I said, no. Most of these things are due to common cold. It's not likely it has got into the lungs. The first thing I ask them is, is there difficulty in breathing? in breathing? Is the child having fever? Because the problem today is that people are very scared many times. So every cough and catar, people go and give antibiotics, antibiotics. Okay. to the point that when the child and because this antibiotic is cause resistance by the time the child now has the real pneumonia you are giving the antibiotics it doesn't work many cough and cata most children are entitled to it about six times a year so i mean so it means you will keep giving drugs and there could be resistance the other extreme to it is this most of the a lot of times when pneumonia comes up they are the things the signs you see are usually cough Mm. And some people will think, some people may think it's still maybe common cold if they are not sensitive enough. But then you can also see things like difficulty in breathing, which some people may not be able to recognize. For example, not every mother can recognize when the child is breathing fast. Or some people just say, well, maybe because the child is not feeling fine, because there could now also be fever. So the parent may think it's malaria, and they go and give malaria drugs, so that by the time they now realize that this thing is serious, I mean, the, the pneumonia is now severe, mm. and that's where a lot of children die. So that's the reason why people can't diagnose, most people don't diagnose it well. It's either they're they overdiagnosing it and thinking it is just common cold, mm. or they don't know that it's pneumonia until they've treated other things, okay. maybe like typhoid, malaria, and all that, then they now realize that this is pneumonia, mm -hmm. and at that stage, it's now severe mm -hmm. and life-threatening, because mm -hmm. almost all the lungs is affected already, mm -hmm. and a lot of children die from it. From it. It's a pneumonia is uh, the single biggest infectious killer of children and it has claimed over 800,000 lives annually. That's Yet right. pneumonia remains a neglected disease. Yes. Why is it neglected? Well, it's uh, probably also because um, it's easy to promote things like malaria, you know, and uh, measles and mm -hmm. diarrhea because people can easily recognize those things. But just as you rightly said, pneumonia kills more people than all these diseases combined. 800,000 annual. Yes. That's huge. Yes. So that means that um, about um, a, a person, a child dies of pneumonia every 39 seconds. Mm. And in Nigeria, it's actually 162,000 people annually. That means that every minute, you have about 20, 20 children in Nigeria dying of pneumonia. Of pneumonia. So you, you can just imagine a bus, mm. a 20-seater bus, and just as an accident, and everybody dies every day. You can imagine the implication. So um, I, th I think the reason why it's not people are not well aware of it is because people just assume that you know any cough, any difficulty in breathing, maybe it's common cold, or most people don't recognize it until it's in the severe stages. And I think what you're doing now is very, very good. This program is very good to sensitize people on how to prevent it. Because I think that's the most important mm -hmm. thing. Because it's always not always easy to recognize. It takes someone that is smart and educated to recognize it. And know that I tell you, ask them, I ask mothers, you have thermometer when your child is having cough. Don't just say it's cough. Mm. Please, when you see cough, when you see cut and all those things, please check the temperature. If the temperature is normal, okay, you may say just take vitamin C and cough syrup and all that. But if it's high, it may be a sign that there is a respiratory infection going on. Hmm. Are you noticing the child finding it hard to breathe? So it's important that we teach people on how to recognize all these subtle signs that okay. could be signs of pneumonia. You said something that it's, it's common among children. Yes, very common among from children. From age, like maybe from age one to like yes. eight years. From, from even the first day of life to about okay. five years, that's where it's most common. Okay. Although most of the deaths are occurs in children less than two years. So let me say, why is it common among the children? Is it because, you know, like this saying, I don't know whether it's a myth or a fact, that yeah. when you expose a child to too much of cold, he or she can come down with pneumonia or any cold-related ailments. Okay. So is, what, what is causing this among the children, but clearly at that tender age? Well, um, first you must, must understand that for children, their immune system is not well developed like that of okay. adults. And um, 
that's one reason why they are at risk of many infectious disease, mm. not just um, pneumonia. I mean, things like malaria, like typhoid fever, like diarrhea. Once it's infectious, they have a higher risk of having all these diseases. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, then another thing about children is that pneumonia, one of the risk factors or the things that put people at risk of pneumonia mm. or is uh, malnutrition, you know, when the child is not eating adequately. And uh, for most adults, most adults would have grown to a point that they are comfortable. But most children, a lot of our children in Africa are underweight mm. and are not eating sufficiently. Especially when you look at the local communities and it puts them at high risk of um, pneumonia. That's why, that's why it's not too common in adults, but it's, it's a lot um, common among the children. Among children okay. yes. So it doesn't have to do with a room temperature where the child is being kept or where the parents put the child. It doesn't have to do with whether the place is cold or not. Well, that's not, those are not the cause of okay. um, pneumonia or, okay. you know, that, that's not the major cause. Mm. Well, um, a cold, an environment that is too mm. cold might um, reduce, it. yes, okay. might reduce the basal metabolic rates of, I mean, or activity of a child and mm. may predispose the child to certain things. But the major cause is not cold. The major cause is infection. Then another thing that probably is not mentioned about children is, is um, for adults, we, are easily, we can make decisions ourselves, surely. But for most children under five, I mean, they may not be able to communicate easily when they are feeling a particular illness. Do you understand? So that may actually also put them at risk. So it's not about the temperature. Yes, we need a good temperature to be comfortable because the um, enzymes and hormones in our bodies they work within a particular range of temperature. So if the environment is too hot or is too cold, it could predispose the person to disease. But temperature itself is not the real cause. Okay. Yes. For children. For children, yes. Okay. Now you've talked about risk factors for yes. children. It's not so common among the adults. Yes. But there are also risk factors, something that can put them at yes. risk yes. of pneumonia. So what are these risk factors for the adults? Well, for the adults, it's all it's similar to children. It's just okay. that um, it's more common in children. First mm. is um, when, there is when there is pollution in the environment. What, I mean, what do I mean by pollution? I mean things like um, if an adult that, that's, when you, is, that is exposed to smoke or smoking, someone that is smoking, okay. whether active or passive, because if someone is smoking in your, uh, before you, you also have the risk of inhaling um, those tobacco, um, uh, the smoke. Okay, so that puts the person at risk. If the environment is not clean, because most of this, um, this infection, immune infection, is caused by, inf by um, bacteria. I mean, commonly um, the streps, togo cause pneumonia bacteria, and the hemophilus influenza bacteria. So if the environment is dirty, it could predispose the person to, uh, to pneumonia. Then, of course, in some environments where people use things like wood, like charcoal to cook, mm -hmm. That also makes the person, it's also a big risk factor mm -hmm. uh, for, for pneumonia. Of course, uh, for, for nutrition is not a major issue for adults, but also adults that are not well nourished, okay, nourished. are not well fed, fed, could be at risk because a good nutrition helps to boost the immune system, especially when it's rich in fruits and vegetables and all that. And that thing that is also a risk factor for both even children and adults is mm -hmm. certain diseases. For example, a child with sickle cell disease is at risk of, um, of and even an adult, okay. at risk of pneumonia. And of course, whether children or adults with, that have HIV, they are at risk because their immune system is depressed. And in fact, there is a special bacteria that is more common in them. It's called the pneumo, um, pneumocystis duovecchi uh, bacteria that has a special um, treatment. So um, those are some of the, then of course, heart diseases also can also predispose and other um, respiratory tract diseases like asthma um, and other diseases okay. can also put the person at risk okay. of um, okay. pneumonia, whether adult or, or a child. child. Before we talk about some meat around this pneumonia, yes. I think it's also imperative for us to know whether it, maybe it's genetic, that is, is it hereditary? That's does, true. It run, does it run in families? No, it, do, it doesn't okay. run in families. Okay. Uh, pneumonia is an infection. Okay. And um, if a person is exposed to the infection, the person as it becomes, um, gets um, mm. the disease. Okay. okay, so it doesn't mean that if a father has, the child will have. There's nothing okay. like that okay. when it comes to pneumonia. So if it's something like that, then it means that we need to be thinking of something else. Okay. Maybe not pneumonia. Not pneumonia. Okay, still digging deep into the uh, champion in the fight against pneumonia. Yeah. I think, it, like I said earlier but during the introduction, that it's also important for us to know what pneumonia is not. Yes. You know, we've talked about that. Maybe there, are, there, there could 
will be similarities of symptoms yes. between pneumonia and other ailments. Yes. So it's good to know that what pneumonia is not. Yes, and, that, and this question is very important because, mm -hmm. as I said earlier, um, pneumonia is commonly um, underdiagnosed or overdiagnosed. Okay, mm -hmm. um, for example, a lot of children come up with common cold, um, acute coryza, where they have catar, they have cough, and all that. And most people just assume that there is an infection. Unfortunately, acute coryza is commonly caused by vi viruses. And most of the time, we just supportive management, mm -hmm. um, giving vitamin C, some cough syrup, and some warmth and all of that, the child gets better without any antibiotics. antibiotics. Because the problem is that once you give antibiotics, you are increasing the chance of resistance. So that when the person now comes up with pneumonia, the person, you know, cannot get proper treatment again. So mm -hmm. it's not common cold. Pneumonia is not sore throat, okay. which is acute um, pharyngitis. Okay. Okay. It's not acute laryngitis, where the mm -hmm. person has loss of voice or has okay. of voice and all of that. And pneumonia also is not malaria. Okay, because um, some people, not every fever is malaria. Because mm -hmm. when a child is hot, they just feel it must be malaria. It may not okay. be. Okay. It's unfortunate that we don't have access to good healthcare centers, you know, in our environment. So people have to do self-medication, which is not the best. But you see, when a child has fever, you have to look at many things. For example, you want to check the temperature of the child. You want to check the respiratory movement right. of the child. Is the child having difficulty in breathing or breathing well? You want to check other things. Okay, so such a child may have um, pneumonia. So, and it may not be pneumonia. So the fact that a child has fever and child is coughing may actually not be pneumonia. It may be mm -hmm. an acute cacoriza or a common cold and a malaria together. So okay. it is not um, all those things. Mm -hmm. And it's important that people understand what um, pneumonia is. There are other okay. things that could mimic pneumonia, but okay. it, it, it's always best, actually, if for, for as many people that can afford it, that when they have any sickness or fever, they see a clinician, mm. you know, a doctor to help make a proper diagnosis because okay. that's where proper care starts from. And that prevents the patient from coming when um, it is very, very severe. Okay. Yeah, before we, we go on a short break and uh, uh, there is this... I think this year is the 10th anniversary of World Pneumonia Day and like the, the, the team is championing the fight against pneumonia. During your introduction, you said something about lung infection. Yes. Now, yes. Uh, how possible is, can your lung be infected? As in, what are those predisposable uh, factors that can cause lung infection? Well, um, as I said earlier, um, pneumonia or which is mm -hmm. normal with lung infection, can be caused um, by introduction by when the person gets those bacteria and viruses or fungi that can get to the lungs. Interestingly, the body is made in such a way that there are protective mechanisms that protect you, your lungs from infection, okay. right from the mouth downwards. I mean, mm -hmm. there, are, um, there are defenses in your mouth, and that's why sometimes we have a cough at times, could be a way of protecting you from getting viruses or bacteria into your system. They are, they, they are um, different parts of the immune systems, like the adenoids and all that, the lymphoid tissues and all that. That's a little bit um, grammar. Okay. That, that's supposed to protect you, mm -hmm. you know, from this infection. In fact, there could be bronchial constriction and all that. But uh, many times, when the body is overwhelmed by this infection, for example, um, when the person is exposed to too much infection in the environment, maybe there are people that are always coughing and sneezing around you. And the body now gets a lot of bacteria that enters and gets as far down to the lungs. Then mm -hmm. the person has a um, higher chance of getting pneumonia. Okay, pneumonia. Okay. We quickly go on a short break. And when we are back, we'll still be talking champion of the fight against pneumonia. Being the team for this year, World Pneumonia Day. My guest is staying in the studio, Dr. Adeleye Barbarista. And we'll be discussing the basis of this discussion together. We'll go on a short break. I'll be back afterwards. Do stay with us.
you for staying being with there with us on gynecology our health program where we'll discuss health related issues coming to you from new frontiers television we are talking about champion of the fight against pneumonia being the team for this year world pneumonia day and my guest is the air dr adelaide barbarisa well during the research on this topic i stumbled on something that we have community acquired pneumonia yes what does that mean well, the reason, that's the major kind of pneumonia, but the reason why that has to be classified, it's because um, there are two major kinds of pneumonia that a person can have. It could be community acquired, it could okay. be hospital acquired, which is otherwise oh. called nosocomial um, infections, okay? okay. Um, community acquired is what we acquire in the community. I mean, from the things we mentioned, like someone is sneezing, someone is coughing, someone is smoking, mm -hmm. there's um, different deaths in the community that we get into our system, and all that that's community acquired but where hospital acquired comes in is that the person that goes to hospital is essentially normal mm -hmm. okay the, he, he probably just has malaria which is possible and goes to the hospital or something else uh, maybe hypertension or a kidney problem and he probably within the hospital he develops pneumonia then that's what we call hospital acquired so but for, yes it's okay. very possible so for someone it to that doesn't have it anyway. yes okay. yes and that's why ideally we don't just admit people anyhow in the hospital because even hospital people can be at risk of infection within the hospital if you understand so um a person that um so for it to fall into the category of hospital acquired pneumonia it means that the patient must have been in the hospital for at least two days before the symptoms of pneumonia set in the reason why that criteria is important is because the difference, the treatment differs, okay? Um, the um, one that is caused by the, the hospital, the community acquired pneumonia is commonly caused by gram-positive bacteria, okay. which include things like streptococcus pneumonia, hemophilus influenza, you know, and all of that, Klebsiella pneumonia and all of that. Why the hospital acquired pneumonia is caused by gram-negative bacteria? which include things like um, esterosia, um, pseudomonas, mm -hmm. and all that. So, and the treatment is different. So that's the reason why when you see a patient with pneumonia, you want to be sure, mm -hmm. was this just in the community or was it in the hospital it was acquired? So that's the difference uh, between mm -hmm. both kinds of pneumonia. But their symptoms are basically the same, okay. majorly the so same. So apart from community and the hospital, are there yeah. other categories what? from the one you said? Those are the major okay. kinds of pneumonia. Okay. okay. Um, the other thing that we look at when we talk about pneumonia is what we talk about non-severe pneumonia and severe pneumonia. Okay. okay. Non-severe pneumonia is just when um, the patient probably has um, signs of pneumonia, which in, which may include fever, I mean, could difficulty in breathing, and some um, the increase in respiratory rates, but it's not severe to a point where the patient will likely die without treatment. For example, a patient could be as bad as the person would be um, seriously, would have serious difficulty in breathing, where the person cannot even talk or cannot even eat because of, you can, you can, of course, you can't miss it. Mm -hmm. And it could be as bad in some cases where the patient can become weak and unconscious. So those points, kind of pneumonia, are what we call severe pneumonia. Okay. Okay, but there is not severe, which many times you could give drugs and the person can go home and get treated. Okay, so maternal pneumonia, which is the one that women can come with in pregnancy, isn't it? Okay, yeah. Okay, so are there any complications for women with pneumonia in pregnancy? Well, um, a woman needs to be held in pregnancy because okay. um, any sickness a woman has in pregnancy um, might be transmitted to the unborn child. Okay, so be, and um, the health of a woman is very, very important because she needs to be strong to also deliver a baby. Mm. So if a woman in pregnancy has pneumonia, then um, number one, it affects the chances of a successful delivery. Okay. Because imagine if it gets complicated, the woman gets weak, um, she may not be able to deliver properly. Um, it may also increase the chance of the child getting infected because um, it could also be, even though it's not commonly, but it could also be transferred in, through the blood. Okay, so, and the child, the baby can have what we call um, congenital pneumonia, where the baby has pneumonia before the baby is born. So, um, essentially, you want a woman in pregnancy to be healthy, mm. because that increases the chances of giving mm. birth to a healthy baby. Okay. Yes. You know, we said something that it, a pneumonia kills uh, 800,000 child annually. Yes, all over annually. the world. Yes. So, at what stage would you say pneumonia becomes a life-threatening? Well, I, I would say first that you don't want to wait for pneumonia to be life-threatening before you okay. treat it. 
<laughs> because um, it's pathetic when you see children die of pneumonia. It's it's very pathetic because mm -hmm. you know it comes. You, you, it gets to a point. I mean, uh, you, the picture you have to have in your mind is a child that is living on oxygen. Mm -hmm. See, when it gets back to a point where a child needs oxygen to mm -hmm. be able to breathe. breathe then you know this thing is getting severe. And you don't want to wait until that time because when it gets to that stage, the chance of the child surviving is reduced. I mm. mean, the child is having difficulty in breathing so that the chest is caving in. Normally, when we breathe, our chest expands. The chest expands when we breathe. But in children that have severe pneumonia at times, when they are, can they are breathing, their chest is going inside. So um, those, they are, they are, they are severe signs. The child can't eat, the child can't drink, the child, child can't breastfeed if it's a baby. Mm. You know, those are signs of severe pneumonia, but you don't want to wait for that time. In fact, it is better that people, and that's why we, have, we, we, we can't just keep praying that our primary health care centers begin to become very functional. It's just better. When people have a sick, they go to the nearest primary health care center mm. and they, get, they, they, they do proper examination. There are signs we check. We check things like the temperature, we check things like the respiratory rate, you know, we check um, the pulse. All these signs will help us differentiate whether this is just a mild, um, non-severe pneumonia or a severe pneumonia. Okay. okay so uh, by the time the respiratory rate is markedly high, um, the pulse is, I mean, is very, very high, the temperature is severely high, then you know that you may be dealing with something severe. So um, it's just better when people are sick. Um, they go to a qualified health professional, medical personnel, and get proper treatment. But waiting before you see those signs, by the time it's getting to those signs, mm. I mean, we don't want any child to die of pneumonia. Mm. It's said that 80% um, of pneumonia deaths could be preventable. preventable. It, it, and that's exactly. what makes it painful. There are some preventable deaths. Yes, mm. that's what makes it painful. What makes it painful is that it's easily treatable. I mean, with, with amoxicillin, which a lot of us know about. I mean, people can get treated, and okay. that, that, that's not advising someone to go and treat it okay. ourselves. But you know, it can be easily treated, but like some diseases. But the painful thing is, a lot of children are dying from it because so it's, when it's, it's, it's curable. Yes, it's curable. Okay. It's curable as long as you don't let it get to that point where it is deadly, and you don't want to wait until that point before the person goes to the hospital. Okay. Unfortunately, that is when a lot of people bring their kids to the hospital. They would have treated for malaria, they would have treated for, for typhoid, they would have treated for cold, they would have done everything for weeks. When the child is now not responding, and they now start seeing obvious signs of distress, they come to the hospital. And if they're unlucky, tell you what we have in some of the local areas where some of these centers don't have oxygen that may help to sustain the child while the infection is being cleared, you know, many of these child eventually die. Mm. And it's quite unfortunate. Hmm. Okay, you've said it's tr it's treatable, it's yes, curable, it and we have vaccines as well, for yes. particularly for children. Yes. How accessible, how affordable are these vaccines for parents to to uh, to get for their children? Well, accessible, I'll say yes. Okay. Affordable, it depends on the um, financial status or the economic status of the parents. Okay. Mm. Uh, most um, local governments and um, states. General hospitals have um, these vaccines. Uh, first, I will say that there are different vaccines that will help to protect against pneumonia. Some of them are directly associated with pneumonia, while there are others that are not directly associated with pneumonia, but they help to reduce the incidence of pneumonia. And some of these ones are free. For example, measles vaccine is free, and um, pneumonia could be a complication of measles. Okay. okay, so when the person takes measles vaccine, the person is reducing their chances. Of getting pneumonia. Okay. Um, the vaccine for pertussis is also free. It's, it's under the DPT vaccine or the pentavalent vaccine. And um, the vaccine um, for um, there's, a, there's a third one, BCG, yeah, which okay. is for tuberculosis, is also free too. So those ones are free and every child should have that. But the one that is directly with pneumonia, pneumonia. the Hemophilus influenza vaccine and the um, that's the pneumococcal vaccine and um, the sorry the pneumo the strep sococcus pneumonia vaccine that's the pneumococcal vaccine and the influenza vaccine are not free and most parents will have to have pay for it. Pay for it. But efforts are being made to see how these vaccines can be subsidized, can be subsidized so that many more um, okay. patients or parents can afford to uh, okay. provide for their children. Okay. Still talking about championing the fight against pneumonia. You know, sometimes that we Nigerians, particularly, we always leave everything for the government to do. Government should do this, government should do that for us. But this is our health, and yes. health is wealth. Yeah. Now, talking about championing the fight against pneumonia, 
whose responsibilities it is. Is it the parents, the government, the health sector? Who has a major role to play? I think it's an extremely important question uh, okay. because um, we need to get beyond the point of where we depend on the government for everything. Because actually, we are the government. Um, because um, the government is not a person. The government is a system. One man can't control the whole country. There are systems in place, and all of us have a part to play. For example, you're a journalist, and um, through this um, program, you're sensitizing people about pneumonia. Mm -hmm. You might be saving just one life, or 10, or 100, but that's a part, a strong part you're playing. And you can increase the advocacy to a higher level. You know, I'm not here because it's convenient. I'm here because this is the part I need to play. Hmm. The same way to every one of us needs to be involved. Because, you see, when it comes to keeping the environment clean, clean. it also starts with us. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, the environmental sanitation was, was started once in a month. But it, you'll be surprised these days during the <laughs> normal environmental sanitation. Mm -hmm. Everybody's at home. Nobody's involved in, in, clean, mm -hmm. in cleaning the environment. So... What I'm trying to say is that all of us need to be involved in all of this, okay? Like, um, mothers also need to remind themselves that they need to breastfeed their children exclusively for six months. It's tough. Surely when mm -hmm. mothers have to Working go to work, house, exactly. you understand? So, but the truth is that little things like this, if all of us play our own part, and I, I explain this to people this way, the first thing you have to do is that you have to take responsibility for yourself. So I want to say that, okay, for me, I don't want to have pneumonia. And I do everything possible to ensure that I don't have pneumonia. I get vaccinated. I keep my environment clean. Mm -hmm. You know, I make sure that I take a balanced diet. Healthy food. The healthy foods and all that. And I protect mm -hmm. myself. Then I protect my family, which is very, very important. Okay? Then I protect my community. And community could mean different things. Okay? For example, if you live in an estate, that's a community. So when you have um, landlord meetings and all that, you can... If there are things that could predict, that could preserve the pneumonia in the environment, you can talk about it. If you are in a church or a mosque, you know you can create advocacy. You know even among the children, you know and everywhere. So what I'm trying to say is that everything we can do to ensure that we put an end to this deadly disease, we mm. need to, to do. do. Mm. You know, and what I tell people, because we go to communities. I, I mean, the last um, six years, I I a privilege to run an organization called Check. It's called Creating LD Communities and Kinship. Uh, medical missions and what we do is that we go to communities and we've been to 100 communities and what i do is because i try to explain things in a way that people can remember so i so i tell people seven tips that if you can follow those things you can actually be on top of most diseases that you can talk about and i made it easy for people because i always want people to remember i use the acronym healing which is h-e-a-l-i-n-g okay so the h just stands for hygiene I don't need to explain about that. Sure. Personal environmental. Mm -hmm. The E stands for exercise. Most of us take it for granted. But the truth I is that... it doesn't matter. Yes. It mm -hmm. makes a whole lot of difference. Because exercise even helps your lungs. Sure. So and that even reduces you from having the risks of pneumonia or any of those things. The A death stands for abstinence. I tell people abstinence, there are some things that are pleasurable but are not safe. Okay? Um, imagine, like smoking. We even increase your risks of getting pneumonia. So if you can avoid smoking... If you can avoid um, extramarital affairs or pre, you know or pre or what how do we call it unsafe sex Extramarital you sex. know mm. unsafe sex that's what that's what we call it generally okay. because there are different debates as regards mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. all that if you can avoid because that possible at risk of HIV and that causes can also increase the risk of pneumonia you know and avoiding other things that could be at risk so the hell there I call it living food. Of course, mm -hmm. we talked about diet. And you take more water, more fruits, more vegetables, which most people take for granted. Protein. Those things contain things that, uh, that protect the body, that boost the proteins, yes, mm -hmm. especially for children. Mm -hmm. It makes them grow well and makes them strong to be able to overcome you know, all these diseases. So, so that's why that, that's the health for living food, high for insurance. Insurance um, talks about it's good everybody is on insurance. Which is an Oyo State has this Oyo Share, Oyo State Insurance Agency, where with a little amount of money, you know, you can get free care time you go to the like hospital. Like the NHIS? Yes, the NHIS. Okay. It's a bit, just about 8,000 naira or 10,000 naira a year, you know. And that way, when you are sick, you don't have to be bothered. That, uh, you just go to the hospital, you get good care, and you go back home. Okay, the end there stands for night rest. Of course, most people don't sleep rest you go to sleep. well. Mm. And you see, you, you can feel it. When you sleep well during the night, you wake up, you feel refreshed. Compared to when you sleep for three hours, you mm -hmm. wake up and you are still sleeping at work. Because your body system now becomes stronger and be able to fight against it. And you realize when you are stressed, 
we are at more risks of getting infections, malaria and all that. So people have to rest well. Then the G there, terrible stands for God. Because the truth is that even in medicine, we say we care, God cures. Of or course. we care, God heals. Um, there, we know quite a lot, but there's still a lot more we don't know. And it's always good to trust God for the best. Mm -hmm. You know, so even I don't believe in God, I say good mindset. You know, but it's always good to believe that you can be healthy and be ready to pay any price for you to stay healthy. To stay healthy. If we do all this, we take mm -hmm. responsibility for our health and our community health. We'll be surprised that it will even make the work of the government easier and they will be able to impact more lives. Oh, you made a very cogent point. Is pay any price yes. for you to stay LD. Yes. And it's just to buttress everything that we have been saying since that for you to pay that price, we have a lot at line for you to do. Making your environment clean. Yes. Like you said, eating LD food. Yes. Exercising. Yes. There are lots. Yes. Though it might be it might come in a hard way. Yes. It might not be that easy. Yes. But Price the result pays. When it's, you see it's, yourself, exactly, yes. it's a price that you have to pay. Yeah. And above all, even if at all you notice any of the symptoms, anything strange within the body system, like you rightly said, that present yourself early yes. to the hospital for Very proper well. medical attention. Very if important. you are thinking it's malaria, it might not be malaria. It might it's, it might be something else. But how will you know if you are staying at home and be treating malaria? That's all these yes. are one of are the prices you have to pay for you to stay healthy. And this is well with calling it a day, particularly on this segment of the discussion on pneumonia. We've been talking about championing the fight against pneumonia. I've been the team for this year, 2019, World Pneumonia Day. I want to say a big thank you to Dr. Adeleye Babarisa for coming on to educate us on pneumonia today. And I believe that we have learned one or two lessons, particularly for parents on this program today. So once again, thank you so much for being part of this program. We've privilege. said so much about our eating habits, our, all the prices we have to pay to stay healthy. And there's another thing that is very, very important in which will be our eight tips for this episode of the program is the issue of losing weight. Some people have are battling with how do I share this weight, how do I lose, lose this weight. Mm -hmm. But there are so many health tips that can yeah. guide us in achieving this. These That's are right. what we are going to bring to you on our health tips for this program. And Caroline Alabi brings you the report. Health tips for losing weight and overcoming obesity. The weight loss industry is full of myths. People are often advised to do all sorts of crazy things, most of which have no evidence behind them. However, over the years, scientists have found a number of strategies that seem to be effective. Here are a few weight loss tips that are actually evidence-based. Drink water, especially before meals. It is often claimed that drinking water can help with weight loss, and that's true. Drinking water can boost metabolism by 24 to 30 percent over a period of 1 to 1.5 hours helping you burn off a few more calories. One study showed that drinking a half liter of water about half an hour before meals helped dieters eat fewer calories and lose 44% more weight compared to those who didn't drink the water. Drink green tea. Like coffee, green tea also has many benefits, one of them being weight loss. Though green tea contains small amounts of caffeine, it is loaded with powerful antioxidants called catechins, which are believed to work synergistically with caffeine to enhance fat burning. Although the evidence is mixed, many studies show that green tea, either as a beverage or a green tea extract supplement, can help you lose weight. Try intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting is a popular eating pattern in which people cycle between periods of fasting and eating. Short-term studies suggest intermittent fasting is as effective for weight loss as continuous calorie restriction. Additionally, it may reduce the loss of muscle mass, typically associated with low-calorie diets. However, higher quality studies are needed before any stronger claims can be made. Cut back on added sugar. Added sugar is one of the worst ingredients in the modern diet. Most people consume way too much. Studies show that sugar and high fructose corn syrup 
consumption is strongly associated with an increased risk of obesity, as well as conditions including type 2 diabetes and heart disease. If you want to lose weight, cut back on added sugar. Just make sure to read labels, because even so-called health foods can be loaded with sugar. Eat less refined carbs. Refined carbohydrates include sugar and grains that are stripped of their fibrous, nutritious parts. These include white bread and pasta. Studies show that refined carbs can spike blood sugar rapidly, leading to hunger, cravings, and increased food intake a few hours later. Eating refined carbs is strongly linked to obesity. If you are going to eat carbs, make sure to eat them with their natural fiber. Exercise portion control or count calories portion control. Simply eating less or counting calories can be very useful for obvious reasons. Some studies show that keeping a food diary or taking pictures of your meals can help you lose weight. Anything that increases your awareness of what you are eating is likely to be beneficial. Keep healthy food around in case you get hungry. Keeping healthy, food can, uh, keeping healthy food nearby can help prevent you from eating something unhealthy if you become excessively hungry. Snacks that are easily portable and simple to prepare include whole fruits, nuts, baby carrots, yogurt, and hard boiled eggs. Do aerobic exercise. Do aerobic exercise. Doing aerobic exercise is an excellent way to burn calories and improve your physical and mental health. It appears to be particularly effective for losing belly fat, the unhealthy fat that tends to build up around your organs and cause metabolic disease. Eat more fiber. Fiber is often recommended for weight loss. Although the evidence is mixed, some studies show that fiber, especially vicious fiber, can increase satiety and help you control your weight over the long term. Eat more vegetables and fruits. Vegetables and fruits have several properties that make them effective for weight loss. They contain few calories but a lot of fiber. Their high water content gives them low energy density, making them very filling. Studies show that people who eat vegetables and fruits tend to lose weight. These foods are also very nutritious, so eating them is important for your health. Get good sleep. Sleep is highly underrated, but may be just as important as eating healthy and exercising. Studies show that poor sleep is one of the strongest risk factors for obesity, as it is linked to an 89% increase increased risk of obesity in children and 55% in adults. Beat your food addiction. A recent study found that 19.9% of people in North America and Europe fulfill the criteria for food addiction. If you experience overpowering cravings, it can seem to curb your eating no matter how hard you try. You may suffer from addiction. In this case, Seek professional help. Trying to lose weight without first combating food addiction is next to impossible. Eat more protein. Protein is the single most important nutrient for losing weight. Eating a high protein diet has been shown to boost metabolism by 80 to 100 calories per day, while shaving 441 calories per day off your diet. One study also showed that eating 25% of your daily calories is protein reduced obsessive thoughts about food by 60%, while cutting desire for late-night snacking in half. Simply adding protein to your diet is one of the easiest and most effective ways to lose weight. One study showed that replacing some of your calories with protein can cause weight loss of about 8 pounds over time while increasing muscle. Don't do sugary drinks, including soda and fruit juice. Sugar is bad, but sugar in liquid form is even worse. Studies show that calories from liquid sugar 
may be the single most fattening aspect of the modern diet. For example, one study showed that sugar-sweetened beverages are linked to a 60% increased risk of obesity in children for each daily serving. Keeping in mind that this applies to fruit juice as well, which contains a similar amount of sugar as a soft drink. Eat raw fruits, but limit or avoid fruit juice altogether. Carolina Labi, reporting. Perhaps you have been battling with, oh, I'm too big, this, I'm obese, I'm this and that, I need to shed some weight, I need to lose some weight. Those few tips can actually help you to lose that excessive fat, to lose that excessive weight. And some of it is that drinking water, aerobic exercise, which you have said on the program today, eat healthy food, yeah. reduce calories, do much of proteins. I think these are some of the prices you have, you to, have pay. to pay just like we have said and obesity for me it's a no i have a zero tolerance for it because yeah. i think it's not healthy at yeah, all for anybody true. to become obese that's so true. once again i want to say thank you to dr adele babari sir for being privilege. part of the show yeah. until i come your way again next week stay healthy and be blessed it's goodbye for now